Hi, this is Stacia Trivison, and I am so delighted to have in studio today Dr. Gina Dado. She is a board certified OBGYN, American College of OBGYNs, and she has a great story of moving from skepticism to belief in using natural products in her office. And I thought that this is such crucial information. And to get it from an expert is something that women around the world need to hear. So, Dr. Dado, I am so happy you are in studio with us today. And if you'd like to start with your story, that'd be great. Well, thank you, Stacia, for having me get this information out. You've been very instrumental in spreading the word about progesterone cream. And from a medical perspective, I want to also let people know that this is a very instrumental treatment for a variety of different reasons. First of all, you have to understand, being a board-certified OBGYN, fellow of the American College of OBGYN, I do things by the book. Um, I don't take my treatments lightly. I am a practicing OBGYN here in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I love what I do. Uh, I have a lot of patients who teach me a lot about um, what I do. Uh, I tend to listen to my patients, and I learn a lot from their stories. And incidentally, that's what brought me here today with you. I had a variety of patients with a lot of different uh, medical problems, uh, endometriosis, Sjogren's syndrome, uh, people with menopausal symptoms that were suffering terribly and were trying alternative therapies on their own uh, because what I was offering them wasn't making a difference. And that is what uh, brought me to tell you about this progesterone cream. Uh, I had a couple patients that I had treated with endometriosis. I did uh, laparoscopic uh, ablations, treated them with Lupron, did Depo-Provera, did continuous birth control pills. And despite all my best efforts, uh, they were not getting good relief long-term from their endometriosis pain. And incidentally, they came into my office with empty bottles of progesterone cream saying, Dr. Dato, you need to know about this. This made my periods uh, painless, you know, which I was a total skeptic and said, there is no way. Give me this cream. Let me see what this is all about. And uh, I started my investigation. Uh, I did some literature searches about progesterone cream. And as my search went on, different patient situations came to light with benefit from progesterone cream. I thought progesterone was only really used for infertility, luteal phase defect. Um, you know, I knew some women were using the creams over the counter for menopausal relief of hot flashes, but not to the the extent of benefit was realized until I really started my search. I had a patient that had Sjogren syndrome that was on multiple medications who also had endometriosis. And she came in uh, pregnant saying she was using a progesterone cream and had no more medication. She was not using any more medications for her Sjogren's symptoms because she said she didn't need it while she was using the progesterone cream. A lot of times you hear, oh, you know, maybe it's just a placebo effect or this is something that, you know, really is just more of a mental thing that they're not really getting benefit from this cream. But over and over, as I, I saw this recurring theme in my practice and people were very excited and happy to use it, but, and wanted my endorsement saying, is it safe? Is it okay? Because this really makes me feel good. It really made me search and, and find out if this is something, you know, that we really need to know about. Because certainly from my medical training, I never learned about. So I began uh, looking into progesterone cream, reading Dr. John Lee's books, who was really the father of uh, progesterone therapy, transdermal therapy. And once I started reading these books, I got very angry. Uh, These books made perfect sense. Before I thought, oh, I had heard from my medical uh, community that, you know, Dr. John Lee was a quack and that, you know, this progesterone was the cure-all cream and, you know, that's a bunch of baloney. And I really uh, was angered when I was reading his books because they made total 
scientific sense. And it made perfectly good reasons why this cream worked in, in a variety of different, um, you know, physiologic situations. There are a lot of women out there having regular cycles, but they're not ovulating and not releasing progesterone. And I think that's a lot of where this uh, coined term from Dr. John Lee, estrogen dominance, came from, where you have an imbalance of estrogen to progesterone, you know, and learning picking up the actual levels of hormones, uh, not in serum, as we practitioners routinely do, but in saliva. This is a new new era, uh, a new entity for me, and hopefully I can uh, teach other practitioners how to truly manage hormone balance um, with a fine-tooth comb and not what we've been doing in the past. Well, of course, we have the preponderance of breast cancer now, and of course, the Women's Health Initiative in July of 2002 just blew everyone out of the water with the results that actually the synthetic hormones are not helping us. Indeed, they're promoting more breast cancer and causing strokes and heart attacks and things that women didn't have to deal with. Our grandmothers didn't have any of those synthetic solutions to problems, and you know, with the boomers all hitting menopause, a lot of the, um, this is a huge income potential for pharmaceutical companies. And of course, we're going to say right up front, we're not here to, uh, you know, nail pharmaceutical companies. They make wonderful, wonderful drugs that my husband is actually alive because of. But actually, the estrogen is something we can now look at and say, hey, it's not doing what it should do. And um, it's, you know, when a typical woman in America goes to the doctor, the first thing they take is a blood test. And like, like you said, that's not showing their progesterone, and many times that's the lost hormone, and that has such an impact on our bodies. And, you know, it's interesting you said that a woman doesn't even know she's not ovulating, doctor, that uh, she could be having her regular cycles. And I've read where at age 35, 50% of women in America actually are not ovulating. And the problem with that is if there's no ovulation, there's no protection. And so then we get this runaway estrogen train in our body, and that can start building cells and causing fibrocystic breasts and uterine fibrases. Is, is that right? Yes, that is correct. And that's where a lot of the different symptoms uh, occur. Migraine headaches, PMS, um, bloating, um, like you said, the fibrocystic breasts, endometriosis, fibroids. You know, in this day and age, we have wonderful technology being able to create procedures to take care of female gynecologic disorders with a minimally invasive procedure, such as laparoscopic hysterectomies, laparoscopic myomectomies, hysteroscopic procedures, uterine ablations. But, you know, it, it makes you think as a practitioner, why are all these women having these gynecologic problems? You know, in the days of my mother and my grandmother, um, they all had their uteruses. Um, you know, they weren't having the problems that we're having today. Why are all these women having such painful periods and heavy bleeding and needing to have all these surgeries? And that's really kind of where I'm coming from, because I think that ideally, if we can get women in true hormonal balance, um, the female system is going to work the way it's supposed to, and we're not going to need to be doing these procedures as wonderful as they are. Well, I know that there's something called the glass ceiling. We've all heard of that. And now they're saying there's a gray ceiling for the senior citizens trying to get jobs. But we've had that hormone ceiling over our heads for years. I just wonder how many women out there in careers that are trying to be promoted can't control those emotions five days out of the month. And that's that's affecting any kind of a promotion they can ever have, affecting the income their family can appreciate. And and you, you are an ob -gen. I mean, you deal mm -hmm. with hormones 24-7. And I'm a woman at I that. Know, I you, have those hormones you in deal me. deal with your own, yes. <laughs> You know, and, and truthfully, you know, when you're reading these uh, books all about PMS and my husband runs away from me that week before my period, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm dealing with this on a firsthand basis. Um, but one thing I do want to um, tell you, and this is something that I think is, is truly important, is, you know, why we're not able to pick up on this whole progesterone um, thing. Uh, like you said, with uh, like the blood test, for example. We check a blood test on a woman 
She comes into the office having all these problems. We check her FSH, follicle stimulating hormone level. And if it's normal, we say, well, you're not uh, menopausal. So, you know, I'm really sorry. You know, there's other things, you know, PMS, you have PMS, we can um, have you, you know, do the right things, exercise and take your calcium and uh, stay away from the simple carbohydrates and, um, you know, that's great, and that's what we should all be doing. But you know, other than an antidepressant during um, the luteal phase of the cycle, or taking it continuously, um, which a lot of patients are not willing to do, I didn't have any other options. And um, the progesterone cream is something that they've really jumped on. Um, one of the reasons we're not able to pick up the levels of progesterone and serum is because 70 to 80 percent of the progesterone is bound to the red cell membranes. This is carried in the blood and when we check blood tests we spin down the samples and 70 to 80 percent of that progesterone is present in the clot which we dispose of. 20 to 30 percent of the progesterone is bound to cortisol binding globulin which is measured in serum and that's only 2 to 10 percent of the bioactive in the body. The um, transdermal progesterone creams that we're using are 100% bioactively uh, available, and that is picked up in your saliva. The saliva testing that's now available, thanks to a variety of labs around the country, they are able to detect fine changes in hormone balance by testing all the bioactive hormones in the uh, saliva. So this makes a, a, a lot easier uh, measuring and balancing patients' hormones, not just by symptoms, which we did up until just a few months ago for myself and my patients. When there were people that found out that we were going to do this tape, uh, they said, please, please, can you ask the doctor some of these questions? So let's go back and forth between some of these sure. questions and then anything else that you wanted to add later. Okay. This is from uh, a Cheryl in Phoenix. Uh, she said, tell me about using uh, the cream with birth control pills. Now, supposedly she had been told you can use the progesterone cream on the opposite end of the day she takes the pill. But a lot of women are worried that it will reduce the effectiveness of the pill. What's your comment on that? The theory is the synthetic progestins that are found in birth control pills have very long half-lives and bind the progesterone receptors in the body very tightly. It, using transdermal progesterone cream, you will get some of the benefit of the cream. Um, we don't really know the true intricacies and ins and outs of the progesterone receptor binding, but you probably will get some result from the cream, but not what you would normally get if you were not taking any of the synthetic progestins. In terms of efficacy of your birth control pills, we don't think that that's going to hinder anything. There's even some evidence to say that people taking uh, natural progesterone cream prior to ovulation will inhibit them from ovulating. So I don't believe that that should interfere in the efficacy. Some women have said that, you know, the typical side effects from the pill, like the weight gain and the irritability, seems it has less strength when they use the progesterone cream. Mm -hmm. So it helps modify those changes? Yeah, it can, as well as sleep. Uh, I have a lot of patients that complain of hot flashes, uh, waking up at night frequently, and I have seen some benefit in those changes by being on natural progesterone. And how exactly would they use it on the birth control pill? They would take it, what? Day 12? 12 through 26, correct. Um, and you would use a 20 milligram dose, and you can do that either in the form of splitting it half in the morning, half at night, or you can do just one pump at night. Um, you know, the progesterone cream that I like to use is a meter dose pump. Um, there's no measuring that's involved, and one pump is a quarter teaspoon, which is 20 milligrams. The reason we use 20 milligrams is because it really mimics what we are normally making in a normal ovulating woman uh, in the luteal phase or the second half of her cycle. And um, by doing that from days 12 to 26, you stop the cream, and then you have a 
a normal menses a couple of days after you've stopped the cream. As long as we're on usage, how would a person not on birth control pills use the progesterone cream? Really the same way. You would use it, um, especially if you were taking it for, uh, let's say, irregular cycles, acne, um, for different scenarios, endometriosis or fibroids, I usually uh, use higher doses because these are problems that have more long-standing issues with estrogen dominance and using anywhere from uh, one pump or 20 milligrams uh, up to even three to four times a day uh, for short periods of time. The goal is really to get the best benefit symptom-wise with the lowest amount of progesterone possible. So many times you'll have to use higher doses initially, and then over time you can wean. For the average person with uh, minimal symptoms, really it's just the 20 milligram dose um, for half your cycle. But with these long-standing problems with endometriosis, fibroids, I usually start them using the cream instead of day 12 a little bit earlier, somewhere between day 6 and 10, being able to use a little bit more of the cream for longer time during your cycle to really combat that um, estrogen. Uh, you have young daughters. As they get older, they are going to be told from the TV commercials. If you have acne, talk to your doctor about using birth control pills. It is horrifying to me that little 12 and 13 year old girls are being put on birth control pills for acne. Can progesterone help with the, their problems? It definitely can. And many times these girls are having irregular cycles because of the um, initiating menses and having um, what's called oligomenorrhea or just occasional cycles because they're not ovulating regularly. And that is one of the reasons for the acne. So especially in young girls who are not in need of contraception, it's a wonderful option for them. Does it help pain? You know, a lot of them have cramping and they want to feel better. Can it help with that? Absolutely. Um, it can decrease the amount of cramping, the length of the cycle, as well as the uh, heaviness of the bleeding can be diminished with progesterone cream. Now, progesterone cream supposedly has, well, has a lot of properties, but the two I'm aware of is that it's an antispasmodic, so that would then help with the cramping. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And then also it's an anti-inflammatory. So some women that are using this are finding that their muscles and their joints don't ache. So is that also a side benefit of using the progesterone cream? Yeah, it is. And, and interestingly, with the anti-inflammatory effects, we don't really understand the mechanism of action of that uh, scientifically, but incidentally, it's one of the side benefits you know, you'll put patients on it for uh, controlling their cycles. And they say, by the way, doctor, you know, my sore shoulder doesn't hurt anymore. D can that happen? And it, it does. It really does. Continuing on the usage, what if a woman who's listening to this has decided, okay, it is time to get off my HRT? Mm -hmm. How would she go about Is it cold turkey or what do you recommend? Well, first of all, it's very important that when someone is at this point to come off their hormone replacement therapy, that they do it in concordance with their medical practitioner. This is something which um, I can give, you know, guidance and ways of doing it, but everybody is individual. Some people can have abnormalities that are existing that you don't know of, so it's really important to do this in, in conjunction with your physician or nurse practitioner or somebody who's following your medical care. But if you are at that point, if you have your uterus and are taking a estrogen and a progestin, usually what I do with my patients is take them off of the synthetic progestin and replace the natural progesterone. And I usually start them with a higher dose because their body hasn't seen the uh, benefits of progesterone for a long time. So they'll be using 20 milligrams twice a day, one pump in the morning and one pump at night. The estrogen, because the progesterone sensitizes estrogen receptors in the body, they will need half of the amount of estrogen to get the same benefit, so to speak, or, you know, with minimal symptoms. So usually if someone is on, let's say, for example, um, the uh, estradiol, two milligrams, I drop them to one. If they're on one, 0.5. If they're on a patch, I, the patches now come in a variety of different doses, so it's easy to just get a lower dose patch. Um, you have to be careful sometimes with cutting the patches because the amount of 
uh, adhesive as well as the hormone may leak from the patch. So sometimes that's not as effective, but you can take the patch off early and do it in a wean. What I usually do for patients um, initially is do what I said with the progesterone cream and halving the dose of estrogen for the first few months. Uh, Don't do this over a few weeks. Then slowly over the next couple months, go ahead and do your estrogen even half that. Every other day you'll be taking it. And then um, by your month four to six, somewhere in there, you can many times be just on the progesterone cream. And even that you can wean yourself to about one pump or even half a pump a day. So as Nancy in Las Vegas has asked, this progesterone cream, it really can't hurt you. How do you feel about that? She yeah, says it is, it's safe. It is very safe. It is something that our bodies are very used to. We are using, for the most part, physiologic doses. There are creams out there that are very high percentages, more like the 10%. And you could be getting 100 milligrams of progesterone in a, a quarter teaspoon pump. That's not beneficial. What we're looking to do is just replace what our bodies need in physiologic doses. And it is safe. We are used to having 300 milligrams or more around during pregnancy. Um, we're bathed in it um, for long periods of time in our lifetime. So this is something that will not hurt you. This is not synthetic. This is what your body recognizes as its own. And um, to make sure that you have the right kind, does it have to be USP progesterone? Yeah, there are some important things when you're looking at purchasing progesterone cream. Not all progesterone creams are created equal. It has to be USP, United States Pharmacopeia regulated. That means that the amount or the percent of progesterone in the container truly has what it says it has. Some of these other ones found in in health food stores are not regulated and you know can have a lot less than what's stated. The other thing is it can't be in a mineral oil base or you can't have any mineral oil on your skin. That does not allow any penetration of the progesterone cream into your skin and when you're using a transdermal product that's extremely important. Also, this is uh, many of the creams are uh, made from soy, which is really what you want. There are some that use wild yams, um, and you have to be careful because some of these wild yams, these are not found in the United States. They're from other countries. They may be using pesticides, and um, the safest would be to use a soy based. And you said you like your favorite mm-hmm. is a meter dosage pump, and that. Creams in the jars lose their potency, probably. Is yes, that- if they're in a in a jar, being exposed to the oxygen and uh, exposed to the bacteria from your hand every time you dip into the jar to measure your progesterone cream does decrease potency. And Sue in Scottsdale wants to know, where do I put this cream? Yeah, it's it's <laughs> funny. A lot of my patients uh, ask me, uh, and they whisper to me, Doctor, do I put it on my bottom? No, you don't. Um, you can put it on your face, your neck, your chest, the thin skin of your arms, the palms of your hand. That's where the blood vessels um, are right next to the skin, where the skin is the thinnest. We call it the flush zones. Um, that's the best absorption. Can you put it on your thighs and your abdomen and your buttocks? Yes, you can. And what's important is when you do use the progesterone cream to rotate sites because you don't want to build up levels in the subcutaneous fat of the progesterone cream in one site. So it's nice to to rotate. And again, you're using quarter teaspoon. This isn't a huge amount, so you're not going to be putting it, you know, it's not like lotion where you lather it all over your body. It's just a teeny bit. That's important. Some women think that's what you should do mm-hmm. is lather. Yeah, one little quarter. So if they're, if they're experiencing cramps, is it okay to put it on their abdomen? If they're having fibrocystic pain in their breasts, is it okay to put it there? Sure. Okay. And one lady swears by just putting it on her one shoulder at night and then it doesn't hurt. That's probably the what? Anti-inflammatory? Anti-inflammatory effect. The other thing too is the migraines. Uh, Women who are having the migraines, terrible migraines in a lot of women occur that week before their period. Um, You can be using progesterone cream and pulse it a little bit higher. You know, every three to four hours, you can rub a little even on your temples or on your neck and see if the uh, progesterone will help um, stabilize the vascular tone to minimize the vasodilation and help with the migraine headaches. So as soon as they feel it coming on, they should put a little bit on no matter mm-hmm. what time in their cycle they are. Yes. Okay, good. That's that's wonderful. Now, uh, Bev and Glendale wanted to know, what about 
progesterone cream for women who can't have periods or never had them or so erratic? What would you just pick a day or? Well, what you can do for people who are not having a period, you can start the progesterone cream, wait till you bleed, stop it and then start counting. Um, many times your body will have enough estrogen stimulation from the fat cells uh, in your body to create a lining. Um, there are conditions where that's not the case, but most women have uh, enough circulating estrogen, and by instituting progesterone cream, you will induce uh, a menses. Then once they start cycling, that day that they first bleed or you see red, then you start counting. That's day one. And you stop the progesterone. Correct. Stop okay. the progesterone cream. Wait until day 12. Start your cream and then use it, you know, one pump a day for, uh, you know, 14 days. Stop it. And then you should get a period. Now, if you start bleeding again, you can also stop it and wait and count again. It may take a few months before you really uh, get that erratic um, bleeding out of your system because if you've been not having periods regularly for a long time, it's going to take a while for your body to regulate itself again. So they should just start and stay on it, even if it's 30 days or 40 days until they see red. Is that what you're saying? They start it, um, and then I would use it for 14 days and then stop. Okay, they should stop after 14 mm -hmm. days. And then if nothing happens, then what? Wait, until they, wait oh. until they bleed. Um, if, you know, it, there's a lot of variety on how you can do this, but if someone isn't having a period, if, you know, they go, obviously, too, I have to mention, please check a pregnancy test, because yeah. that's another big reason why that's people true. don't get a uh, period. Yeah. So, um, you know, and that's another thing. That's what I do with, for patients who are actively trying to get pregnant, that I'm um, using progesterone cream. You don't want to withdraw progesterone from someone who's actively trying to get pregnant. So what I have them do is use the cream days 12, and instead of saying stop on day 26, they just continue until they bleed um, or day 35. And then I have them check a pregnancy test. If they're not pregnant, then they can stop it. But you don't want to withdraw someone who's actively trying to get pregnant because if they are pregnant, that's a shock to the pregnancy and can even result in a miscarriage. So stay on it if you're on it to get pregnant until you Correct. see red. Okay. And then take the test. Like you said, Mary Beth and surprise. That was her question about infertility. Now, she um, had... Uh, tried for a long time and then did start using the cream and, and did result in a beautiful, healthy baby boy. So um, I'm glad to hear you talk about the success for that. And Dr. Lee said there's so many pictures of babies that mm -hmm. were never meant to be born in, in his office. Now, how would you use the cream as if you're pregnant? If you're pregnant and you weren't on the cream, then you don't start the cream. Is that right? Correct. Okay. But because they read about the babies having slightly higher IQs with this, but it's no reason to mess with Mother Nature. But if they are pregnant because they were on the cream, they stay on it for how long, doctor? Well, there is variation in opinion. Uh, truthfully, by uh, 10 to 12 weeks, the placenta should be making enough progesterone to uh, kind of take over the um, production of progesterone. Early in pregnancy, when your ovary ovulates, you secrete progesterone from what's called the corpus luteum. And this supports the pregnancy until about 10 to 12 weeks. And that's when the placenta then takes over. So ideally, you can continue till that 10 to 12 week period. But there are reports of people continuing progesterone all the way up until, you know, a few weeks before they're due. How about nursing moms? Nursing moms, um, what I have used in nursing moms, which is a really nice way to help deal with some of the postpartum blues, postpartum depression. When you deliver a fetus and deliver the placenta, you're making anywhere from around 350 milligrams of progesterone daily, and there's an abrupt decrease. And that's why in those first two weeks post-delivery, not only are you sleep deprived and stressed at taking care of a, a new infant, but you're also dealing with the roller coaster of the falling progesterone. So people who are at risk for postpartum depression who've had uh, depression previously and may or may not be on antidepressants either during the pregnancy or or post-delivery, progesterone is a nice way to help them uh, gradually come down on their progesterone. And usually I will have them use one uh, pump a day while they're nursing. They won't be getting a period. 
and there won't be any reason to stop it until they stop nursing. Handling the baby or anything. I mean, not that there's a danger, but I'm just very conservative. Well, when you're putting progesterone cream on, if you put it on your breasts, I wouldn't have the baby breastfeed because very small doses of the cream can be absorbed transdermally. So you don't want to, I mean, and that can be a very high dose in an infant. So, um, you know, if you're using it on your neck, your chest, your uh, thin skin of your arms, you know, that shouldn't be an issue, um, especially a lot of women like to do it at night. So they get a little bit of sleep before the baby's up again. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's also a nice time to, to do it. You put the baby down you put your progesterone cream and you take a nice little nap. Ah, oh, so that helps that. Um, how about um, osteoporosis? Uh, there's a lot of uh, information in Dr. John Lee's book, which we highly recommend getting. I mean, his first book on menopause is called What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Menopause. His second book is What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Premenopause. And that book I highly recommend because it's our history from birth to old age. You don't have to be in premenopause to enjoy that book. And if anybody has breast cancer in the family, boy, I think they should get that What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Breast Cancer with Dr. John Lee because there's so much information in there we could never even begin to cover. Mm -hmm. And we're not oncologist. I mean, you're not an oncologist, and I'm certainly uh, just a researcher, so not even in the medical profession. But, Doctor, I want to ask you about yeast infections. That seems to be a plague to the women. Uh, well, yeah. How can they deal with that? You know, unfortunately, we ha I have a lot of women that come in, you know, week after week with chronic yeast infections. And, you know, why this occurs, um, there is a theory that estrogen dominance um, in these women, which is a common entity, increases the skin and vaginal mucus glucose, which increases candida growth, which is yeast. Yeast love the sugar. And what progesterone can do is help normalize this and decrease the chronic yeast infection. So, you know, if nothing else, this is one entity that can help along with the anti-yeast medications, the um acidophilus, et cetera. Um, you know, the other th medical issue that I see that also helps uh, get better and not dealing at all with the uh, gynecologic system, but is blood pressure. I've seen um, women that I've put on the progesterone cream, especially postmenopausal women who um, have signs of high blood pressure creeping up as they've been um, getting older. And once they're put on the progesterone cream, they need to wean down on their antihypertensives. Um, the progesterone has a little bit of a mild diuretic effect and that's where it may contribute. So you have to follow people, especially older patients, um, on progesterone cream their blood pressure, as well as thyroid. Women who have hypothyroidism, again, this, this estrogen dominance can impact thyroid function and not make the thyroid gland work to its full potential. And this may not be picked up by a blood uh, thyroid stimulating hormone. Many times we test the thyroid, it's normal. But other areas, um, you know, such as acupuncture, um, I have practitioners that say, you know, the, the thyroid is deficiently functioning, but it's not being picked up by the mechanisms that we're able to detect. And by correcting that estrogen dominance with the natural progesterone, people notice that they have to take less of their Levoxyl or Synthroid. So again, um, following along with your medical practitioner, if you are on antihypertensives or thyroid medication, you know, go ahead and, and get your blood pressures checked, get your thyroid levels checked a few months into your progesterone cream because you may find that you need to decrease your medications. That reminds me of a story of a woman, a, a, a friend of mine, and she actually lost her high-powered corporate job. She had lupus. She was on high thyroid medication. She had all kinds of physical problems and uh, frustrated, confined to a couch practically nine months out of the year year and on antibiotics for nine months out of the year. Started the progesterone cream. That was the only change she made in her life. And, and within two years, of course, under the guidance of her medical doctor, he started saying, you know, we can reduce mm -hmm. your Synthroid. We can lower this other uh, medication. And within two years, he gave her a clean bill of health. She's back to work. And the only difference honestly, in her life was the progesterone cream. Mm -hmm. Now, that's astounding to me that um, that can affect the immune system that much. And there's so many people 
Yeah, and you know, in this day and age of women, uh, you know, hurry up. We exercise when we get up in the morning. We get ready. We get the kids ready. We get them off to school. We go to work. We come home. We make dinner. We get the kids to bed after their homework. And, uh, you know, then it's, uh, we got to go buy the birthday presents for the uh, kids' birthday parties. And uh, we have to make sure that the uh, uh, husband's uh, mother's uh, birthday card is in the mail, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> we are on this uh, very um, fast treadmill um, in these days. You know, we're the super women, the super moms. And what happens is we use a lot of cortisol in our bodies to be able to have that fast pace and to have all that energy around. And what happens is you are uh, using your progesterone. Progesterone is precursor to cortisol. And when you use your progesterone, and especially if you're not ovulating because of all this stress, you are so deficient in progesterone. That's why we have this wired but tired uh, situation around and creating all this estrogen dominance. So, you know, unfortunately, in this day and age of we're supposed to be, you know, improving year after year with all this education, um, you know, we're hurting ourselves more than anything. So progesterone really can and has made that kind of a difference. It can calm you down. And besides being nicer, you're actually maintaining your health better internally because it's invisible. We can't see a meter dropping to let us know our progesterone's at zero. Right. And the other thing, too, is, you know, if you're not getting your sleep because you're so stressed, um, that, again, is going to increase your uh, risk for depression and anxiety and irritability and PMS. So it, it kind of breaks that cycle. If you feel better, you sleep better, you act nicer, and, you know, your stress level hopefully will go down. You can handle things mm -hmm. better. Boy, that's important. Tell me about osteoporosis. Do you see anything? Well, the osteoporosis is something that was a big reason why women were initially put on hormone replacement therapy. And what the uh, estrogen does is slow uh, bone loss by inhibiting the osteoclasts or the cells that kind of chew away at the bone. What progesterone does is it stimulates the osteoblasts or the bone building cells of the bone. So there is evidence that progesterone does help maintain um, and even increase bone density. Now, there are definitely more studies that need to be done, um, randomized in women, um, especially of older women who have brittle bones, um, to show a significant difference. But there is a benefit from using natural progesterone in osteoporosis or patients showing osteopenia. People listen to these tapes and they hear you speak mm -hmm. and they hear me speak and they get all excited. I've got to be on this progesterone cream. Doctor, what if you don't have any symptoms? Do you need the cream? Well, you know, I'm kind of of the mentality of don't fix what's not broken. However, in our environment, we are exposed to a lot of of what's called xenoestrogens. Well, first of all, xenoestrogens are estrogen-like compounds that are pivotal in creating this awful thing that we deal with is estrogen dominance. And unfortunately, our meats, our eggs, our poultry, our beef, our, our cattle are being given estrogen-like compounds, growth hormones that um, in, in trace amounts are being um, building up in our bodies by eating these things. Um, these compounds are fat soluble and they don't uh, get excreted from our bodies. They slowly build up in our fat cells and um, from our solvents and carpet perfumes, nail polish, nail polish removers, uh, the dry cleaning solvents that are used, um, plastics and microwaving. When you microwave uh, in your little TV dinner, you know, very small traces of this plastic are getting into our foods. You know, think about it. Years ago, everything came in bottles, soda, juice. You notice our organic juices are in glass. They're not in plastic. Milk, everything was transported in glass. Now everything for convenience, for uh, expense are in plastics. And we're getting slowly exposed to all of these different uh, xenoestrogens. So, if someone is doing absolutely wonderful, they're eating organic foods, they're staying away from 
the uh, pesticide sprayed coffees using organic coffee, a diet in fruits and vegetables, taking their vitamins, they're exercising, and um, having regular cycles with no symptoms. Do they need to be on progesterone? No, not necessarily. But if if you're not doing all these things and you're lacking or having symptoms, you know, you're not sleeping, you're having uh, hot flashes, you're uh, having uh, PMS, you have low libido, you have uh, migraine headaches, you're uh, uh, bloating, you're getting uh, fibrocystic breasts, tender breasts, you're, you have endometriosis, you have fibroids, um, you have painful cycles, heavy bleeding. Those are the people who I think should be on progesterone. Now, Progesterone can help the majority of women with their symptoms, but there are a percentage of women that do need estrogen. What is a safe estrogen? You know, I've heard that there's estrone, estradiol, and estriol. And well, first of all, um, most women, when they're menopausal, do not need extra estrogen. And let me just go a little bit into the science. So forgive me. I know this gets a little technical, uh, but when you are having hot flashes or sweats. Many times this is a sign of either low estrogen or low progesterone in the body. There is an area in the hypothalamus um, where the GnRH, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone, gets stimulated and it stimulates what's called the arcuate nucleus in the brain, which stimulates an area in the brain that controls uh, sweating and capillary dilation. And when you replace either estrogen or progesterone, many times this can cause cessation of these symptoms. So also women who have a normal amount of fat cells will be from an uh, aromatase enzyme creating estrone and enough estrogen to not need a supplemental um, your estrogen at menopause decreases uh, 50 to 60 percent. It doesn't go to zero. However, your progesterone becomes about one 120th of what it was when you were cycling. So estrogen in women who have their ovaries that are menopausal are, is not necessarily needed. Um, now, if you've had a hysterectomy and your ovaries have been removed, you really, uh, if especially if you're a thin woman, you may need a little bit of estrogen. Everybody is different. You know, some people might need uh, a little touch. However, you know, this is where salivary testing is crucial to really um, fine tune and measure what you're needing. You know, women who don't have ovaries, they might need a touch of testosterone as well. Um, in terms of what type of estrogen, you really want to stick to the uh, bioidentical hormones. It's what your body is it has in and of itself. They're the same chemical structure. There's nothing that's been altered to give you uh, different symptoms. And I think that's important. Um, and also, the estrogen doses that we've been using in traditional medical therapy, I think, have just been too high. And if we really fine-tune and use less, less is better. More is not necessarily better in all situations. And compounding pharmacists are very valuable if a woman's trying to stay with a natural type hormone. And hopefully the doctor can is working with the compounding pharmacist. Mm -hmm. And if the woman really, truly requires estrogen, like you say, we mm -hmm. assume we do. And most of us don't. And the Correct. progesterone can help balance that. But there are women that do. And, you know, uh, since I'm not one of those skinny women... Uh, I guess I won't have to worry about that, huh? <laughs> Not a oh, reason. But then to we stay. don't have to worry about the osteoporosis <laughs> either, because that weight bearing that we're doing is really helping those bones. That's so. right. It takes a lot to lift this thigh. <laughs> it's very weight bearing. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you. I'm a woman that suffered five miscarriages from mm -hmm. my after my firstborn. I had five miscarriages before I had my twins, and it was just horrible. Five years of that and the agony and everything, and and after I started doing this research so many years later, I realized, you know, that was my body telling me, because they were luteal phase miscarriages the first three months, that I really needed progesterone. What can you offer? Uh, what information can you give women so they don't suffer like I did if they've got repeated miscarriages? 
Well, again, you know, this is something that should be done in conjunction with right. your, uh, you know, OBGYN. Absolutely. Um, but many women who have recurrent miscarriages, one of the reasons could be a luteal phase defect um, where your corpus luteum isn't producing enough progesterone. And this is something that will not hurt a pregnancy. And this is something that a lot of people can do that really has no detriment. And, and women... Truthfully, there are ways of determining if someone is truly luteal phase defect by doing an endometrial biopsy and sampling and seeing if the secretory phase of the endometrium is in phase or out of phase based on where they are in their cycle uh, pathologically. However, by implementing progesterone cream, you're not going to hurt a pregnancy that doesn't have a luteal phase defect. So... You know, many women say, you know what, I don't want to have to go through all that with the endometrial biopsy and the expense and the discomfort, and they want to do some progesterone supplementation. And I, almost every reproductive endocrinologist in the country is using progesterone either in the form of suppository or cream or gel vaginally uh, to aid and that take that out of the equation. Well, let me see now. I have a choice between a suppository or a vaginal gel. Listen, does the transdermal cream appeal to me more? I think so. <laughs> well, I want to talk about a couple studies that we just need to mention here. And this was talking about breast cancer. Uh, progesterone levels mm -hmm. at the time of breast cancer surgery affects the survival rate. This survival record was reviewed 18 years after breast cancer surgery in node positive people, which means the cancer had spread. It was already metastasizing. With adequate progesterone levels during surgery, this is not additional transdermal cream. This is just the uh, levels they had in their body, the survival rate after 18 years was 62%. If a woman was unlucky enough to be scheduled for surgery during the first half of her cycle from day one to day 12, let's say, so that she had less progesterone in her body naturally, her survival rate was only 30%. So there's a double, twofold, I mean, double your chances of surviving. It's 30% or 62%. Now, this is over 100% improvement just by having an adequate progesterone levels at the time of surgery. And this Dr. Moore said there is no treatment that provides that degree of benefits. Progesterone is the treatment. I was so overwhelmed with this because this information is not out there. My interest began when I lost a family member to breast cancer. And when I discovered some of this, I was shocked because this was there, but no one ever talked about it. And I, I want to talk about breast cancer and natural. Oh, you want to yeah, address uh, that? Yeah, sorry. I just want to comment That's on that, Stacia. Actually, when I had heard that and uh, started looking into that, that was very upsetting to me because I had never heard that. And for all my patients that have had, you know, abnormal mammograms, needing biopsies, et cetera, um, that just blew me away um, that I didn't have that information to spread on to my patients. And incidentally, there are multiple studies in the literature uh, that do support what Dr. Moore has found. And not only is the um, improvement in five-year survival and disease-free interval improved, but also the um, in many of the breast cancer types. Now, it's not all the types, but in many of the types, they have a decreased grade or uh, aggressiveness of the tumor in women who are cycling where the biopsies and or the surgeries were done in the second half of their cycle. So ladies, if you are a cycling woman, someone who is premenopausal and God forbid has an abnormal mammogram or has a mass or needs to have any kind of breast surgery, please have them schedule in the second half of your cycle because you're really be doing yourself a, a, a disservice not to to have that done. And younger and younger women are getting breast cancer. And these women are, are saying, I, my kids are so little. I want, I want any chance I can have to see them graduate from high school. And so why wouldn't they then beg their surgeon, demand it uh, to have be done in the second half of the cycle? By the way, that's Dr. M-O-H-R, and it was in the British Journal of Cancer, 1996. The other thing that I want to talk about, a lot of medical people look for a double-blind placebo-controlled randomized study, and they wanted information, okay, 
okay, show me, you know, using transdermal progesterone, uh, what happens. So this was a study done, and it was shown in the Fertility and Sterility Journal, I'll let you see, April 1995. And this was using transdermal progesterone and transdermal estradiol on real women, not lab animals, who were having breast biopsies. And the breast tissue showed over 100% increased levels above the placebo cream, even though it didn't show up in the serum. And this cell proliferation during the 13-day study, they took the cells, and during 13 days, they put topical progesterone, they gave topical progesterone, and it showed that it reduced cell proliferation 410%. Topical estrogen increased cell proliferation 223%. And let's face it, we want a reduction of the breast cancer cells. And so um, this is the kind of information people will say, well, I didn't know about this. I had my surgery in the first half. What do I do? So to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, just because I lost a loved one, and that's a vacuum that's never been filled, my mission is to educate women. And you people can take this information and do with it what you want. But at least you'll be able to make an educated choice to protect yourselves and your families from loss. When you lose a mom, when you lose a grandmother, nothing replaces it. So if a woman has, you know, had no idea why wouldn't she, if she had mastectomy or lumpectomy, start using this cream? It can't, it doesn't seem like it could ever hurt and only help. Doctor. Yeah, and Stacia, just along those lines, that study was uh, by K.J. Chang and his colleagues, um, like you said, in 1995. And what was really nice about this study, for those uh, practitioners and my colleagues, unfortunately, that say, you know, that progesterone, how do you know you're getting absorption into the uh, skin? You know, oh, there's variations in skin thickness and such. They were able to show that the breast tissue had much higher levels of progesterone. So there is getting, you are getting absorption, excellent absorption from a transdermal cream, um, you know, and you don't need to necessarily take a progesterone supplement orally. By using it orally, you have to use much higher doses in the order of 10 to 20 times because it has to be degraded in the liver. And the liver is really working overtime to, um, you know, metabolize it and to give you the same amount that gets uh, absorbed into the skin without going through the liver. Oh, that's a good point, that transdermal. And that's what Dr. John Lee says, too. He said the transdermal... Well, look at all our medications that are going mm -hmm. to patches and things like that. Um, I want to talk about the men for just a minute. Now, I know you don't see many men in no, your practice. <laughs> unless they're uh, fathers or husbands. I want to just talk about the prostate problems for just a second. And uh, men, too, should be very interested in learning about progesterone cream when it comes to the prostate. When I had Dr. John Lee on um, my radio show, and he said that this is applicable to... Um, men with prostate problems. My dad had been diagnosed with prostate cancer. He has prostate cancer. And for five years, his uh, PSA just climbed, which is not good. And so after the interview with John Lee, I took the cream over to my dad and begged him, please do this. And he was, and he's in his 80s. He's sick of pills. So he was at least relieved it was just a cream he could just put on his face. I told him to put it on his face after he shaves because that's a habit he's in and it would be easy to remember. And men use the cream every single day. They only use like 10 milligrams. So that would be like a half a pump and a dose meter dosage thing. But anyway, within four months, it was time for him to go back. And for the first time in five years, his PSA count was down. And I have so many stories of men that were going to the bathroom five, six, seven times a night. They couldn't sleep. They were exhausted and their prostates were enlarged. And they started using just a little 10 milligrams of progesterone cream. And within days, within absolute days, uh, they had relief. They were going to the bathroom maybe once a night. And, and and their prostate was being reduced in size because men do have also progesterone and estrogen in their bodies. And they also, progesterone helps balance estrogen. And when a man's testosterone starts dropping, that's when he starts having trouble and the prostate gets enlarged and he starts getting pressure to go to the bathroom. And then it the progesterone will help balance that and they get such relief. And you know what? Their wives say they're nicer to be around. And when my mom started putting the progesterone cream on her knee for the inflammation of her knee, my dad said she was nicer to be around. So what is this with the moods? I don't 
this really helps the moods, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And you don't need to be, uh, I mean, the women, well, I, obviously with hormonal changes, yeah. but you think when you're older, you don't have those, but progesterone cream can help the older people too. You know, uh, from a scientific perspective, uh, there actually is some evidence why uh, progesterone does that because uh, if you're interested, uh, Stacia, in knowing a little bit about that, um, estrogen in your system, it increases the copper in circulation and uh, decreases your zinc. And when you have an imbalance to the estrogen-progesterone ratio, you get exaggerated uh, stress reactions from this imbalance in the zinc and the copper, which results in some mood swings and depression. And therefore, by uh, balancing the estrogen dominance with progesterone, a lot of depression, mood swings, anxiety, and PMS all decrease. So, um, you know, there is a scientific basis for why everybody's getting a little bit nicer on uh, <laughs> progesterone cream. I ran into the husband of a friend in the grocery store and he said, what is my wife taking? And I said, why? It can't hurt her. He said, no, I want to thank you <laughs> for giving me back the girl I married 20 years ago. So, I mean, it, it's nicer. The guys say, please stay on this stuff. Uh, we're getting close to the end of the time and I wanted to mention a few things. First of all, I believe those two studies that I told you are so important that I'm going to have those on my website in the future. So you can go on there and print those out and give it to whoever you care about, whomever you care about. And that will be on my website at uh, www.getsmart911.com. And on that website, it's an informational website. You'll also be able to print out information about women who uh, became pregnant and how it helped the man with the men with the prostate and different things like that because a lot of times the guys want to hear it from a guy okay so you can print out the letter from a guy or the women who are struggling to get pregnant want to relate to someone who was struggling and had success so that website is something you can uh, look at for some information and this cd is going to be made available because this information has to get it. that's why we're here yeah. that's why you gave up your day to day from your busy practice to come over here we have to touch people. We have to give them information. Where will they be able to get this CD, doctor? Well, uh, first of all, they can get it from our websites. Um, my website is Women's Choice with an A, Woman, W-O-M-A-N-S Choice, dot my Arbon dot com. Uh, they can email me on my website and uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, and that's Women's Choice at myarbon.com. I want to help people learn about what's best for them. You know, in traditional therapy, um, we can't help everybody. And I'm really blessed to have gotten this information from uh, Grace and from Stacia and from Dr. Lee and all the information that's out there. It's And my patients, thank you for opening my eyes to what a different therapies are out there and I'm hoping that with my medical background I can show you what's safe and what's a nice alternative to help stop the uh, suffering that women are doing. I really look forward to also helping other uh, physicians, OBGYNs, family practice, uh, primary care. This is something that I think is would be wonderful addition to anybody's practice and can truly help a variety of uh, different situations. And anybody who is in the research field, please, more research needs to be done about this amazing uh, hormone that really has been... Um, kind of uh, swept under the carpet, um, you know, unfortunately, this is a natural occurring substance and uh, pharmaceutical companies aren't really interested in, in the uh, the real thing. They like to kind of tweak it and make it into their synthetics. Uh, you know, it, the money makes the world go round. However, I feel that if we do a lot more research with this progesterone, we can be really making a difference in a lot of severe medical uh, illnesses and help a lot more people than we've been able to help up to today. And if that doesn't convince you, imagine a workplace with no PMS. Imagine no more grumpy mothers. Imagine kids not being afraid to come in the front door wondering. And we can benefit our family so much. And if we 
we take we the nurturers take better care of others than ourselves it's time to really start listening to our bodies because it's not normal for you to have pms if you have any of these symptoms that dr dato was talking about that's your body trying to tell you something is not quite right and it can be fixed and we want to fix it naturally we really don't want to go with the synthetic and if that still hasn't convinced you i can tell you people have lost weight when they start using the progesterone cream if they were overweight because it reduces the edema in the cells and most women are not going to take anything unless they can take two pounds off. I can tell you I lost 35 pounds with the progesterone cream, and I've lost that before, but this stuff never came back. It's a natural diuretic. It's a natural antidepressant. The world's going to look better. Women will say that they actually, with their doctor, wean themselves off their antidepressants after they've been on natural progesterone cream. So why shouldn't we start taking better care of ourselves? And just by listening to this tape, you can educate so many people people. We are the nurturers. We're the educators. It, we can help a niece, a child, a grandchild, a neighbor. There are so many wonderful things we can contribute and make such a difference. If not improve lives, we can actually be saving lives with this information and have an esteemed medical doctor, an ob uh, you know, see and practice and utilize and be open-minded enough to say, yes, you know, there is something like this. I, I don't know what greater gift you could have given us, Doctor. Oh. So I so appreciate you being here. Well, thank you, Stacia. And, you know, along those same lines, you know, you have to find a physician that is open to alternative treatments. In this day and age, we are blessed with having uh, acupuncturists, masters in oriental medicine to help with a variety of different medical ailments, chiropractors, uh, you know, massage therapists, um, spiritual, uh, you know, when you are talking about disease, you know, it's not just take a pill, you'll get better. It's a whole variety of things, diet, exercise, emotional well-being, you know, people that have a positive outlook with cancer and they say, you know what, this cancer is not going to get me. I am going to survive this. They do better than the people who just kind of shrivel up and say, oh, well, I got cancer. I'm going to die. And so, you know, illness is a very complex thing. And, you know, we as physicians do the very best that we can, but we're only human and we only know one way, the, the allopathic way of fixing things. But there's naturopathic physicians, acupuncture, it goes on and on, and a variety of different modalities and are better than one to treat many of the um, more complex illnesses. So, you know, with reputable alternative practitioners, we are going to really make some strides together when we put our heads together in treating these different uh, medical illnesses. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stacia. Bye. Bye. Bye.